Well, greetings and I hope you're all doing well as uh, we prepare to look at uh, some more of Luke chapter 22. Um, you know, I just want to keep encouraging you. Let me know if you're out there. Let me know that you're doing okay, if you're connected with our church. And uh, uh, why don't we pray as we begin, all right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for passages that make us work a little bit harder. And, and I pray today as we, as we read your, your story, as we listen to what you're telling your disciples, may you help us to connect what we need in our lives to, uh, with what you're saying in your word. And so would you come sit with us? Would you talk to us through your word? And would you help our, our relationship with you grow deeper? We thank you for, for everything that you do in our lives, and I pray that you just continue to give us wisdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let me uh, just look a little bit at what we looked at last week. The disciples were uh, sitting there, you know, kind of arguing about uh, uh, who is greatest. Jesus kind of shuts them down, then he begins to warn Peter. He says, Satan has asked to sift you. I have prayed that your faith would not fail and that when you have turned back that you would strengthen your brothers. And so as that kind of takes place, right, uh, Peter doesn't think that's, that's possible. I mean, basically Peter goes, no, I wouldn't do that, right? And so he responds back to Jesus with this, I would go to prison or even death with you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows today, uh, you'll deny me three times. We, we studied that passage. We found some interesting things out about roosters. And, uh, and yet we looked at kind of what this, this interaction that, that Peter didn't believe what Jesus was telling him about himself. And that's a, there's a bit of a pride issue there. And we kind of looked at that pride issue. And, and as, we, as we grow in our relationship with God, as uh, he is being formed in us, that, that, that issue of pride is going to be something that needs to be worked on, needs to be uh, uh, surrendered to him. And we saw that it, it, pride in Peter's life made him blind to the enemy. He didn't even see it coming, even though he was, Jesus warned him, made him deaf to what Jesus was saying. And so um, as we looked at that, how does that relate to our form, his formation in us? Is, is We recognize, man, we need to, you know, we need to be uh, aware of our ability to be prideful and and surrender that to, to him. And, and so, um, so we looked at that last week. And now, now the, the conversation kind of finishes out, all right? So what happens after this piece of the conversation, they head off to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where Jesus prays, and that's where he's arrested. And so we know what's coming, right? But right now, we've got to finish out this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And so he gets done talking with Peter, and Peter, you know, denying that he's going to deny Jesus. And, and so this is what happens next. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you, that, that, tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. All right, so as we look at this passage, let me just begin with this. Uh, there's a hesitation in, on my behalf, and I, and I want to just I want to say this to you. Maybe we don't need to, but but I, I want to admit that this is a tough passage. All right, I mean it. So we can look at it. We can just look at it as information. We can go, oh, this is just what Jesus told his disciples. Blah blah blah. Right. Hopefully that's not what we do. Hopefully we stop and we listen. Okay. Is there anything here that we can apply to our lives? Is there anything that we see in the story that maybe we take to heart and uh, that we recognize as more than just information? And, and so as I studied, I, I read commentaries, I, I went to sermons and looked at other people's sermons, and I mean, that's kind of my, my sources, right? I read over the passage several times, and uh, uh, man, I just... I really struggled because I felt like there were so many times that, that, that people hopped over it. Um, lots of commentators didn't actually make any comments about this passage. Uh, and so I want to proceed with caution, all right? 
Uh, we should. We could have just skipped it. I mean, I, that was. I was tempted. I, we could have just skipped right over it and gotten to Jesus taking the disciples out to the garden. I could have lumped it in with Jesus' conversation last week, but I, I didn't, and so we were kind of stuck. <laughs> so I, I decided, no, we're going to just take it, and, and I'm going to trust that God's going to speak. So as I looked at it, um, you know, what I noticed was is uh, there were some that that kind of took this as a way of of supporting um, the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, maybe the more violent side of them. And then I, I read others that, that really worked at making this about something else. Because what makes it difficult is that Jesus encourages the, the sword, right, the, the, to buy a sword. And that, how does that fit? And so that's kind of where we'll get, we're going to wrestle with that a little bit as we, as we look at this story, all right? So, so let's start with this, all right? Um, we know that uh, uh, as we set the stage for this, that uh, um, we need to be aware that Jesus is continuing to warn his disciples here. This is a warning. There's something ahead of them, okay? And so he says this to them. He goes, you remember that last time? I mean, remember when I sent you guys out and I said, don't, don't take a purse, don't take bags, don't take extra sandals, don't, don't, don't worry about taking food or anything like that. So he goes, you know, the, the last time they were without Jesus really is what Jesus is referring to. Remember that time when, when you were away from me? I sent you out. So for three years, the, the disciples have almost in, have been inseparable from Jesus. That there were times when, when Jesus would, would go and pray to the Father and, and the disciples kind of hung out, right? But then there were these, uh, this other time when, um, when, when Jesus sent them out. And it's, it's interesting, if we think back through the story, I think about the, the time that Jesus sends them out in the boat, right? And they're straining at the oars, trying to make it to the other side, and Jesus has been praying to God, to his Father. And he walks out on the water, right? Peter, Peter's story. They had spent some time away, and, and things weren't always good when, when they spent it away, but Jesus brings up a time when it was really good. Jesus sent out the 12, he sent out the 72. Those stories can be found in other places, but also in Luke chapter 9 and, and Luke chapter 10. And, but they were on this mission for Jesus, and when they went out on this mission, they were received really well, right? I mean, the crowds loved them. These guys were like, man, they were, they were hanging with the most popular, most amazing person in Jerusalem of all time, of Israel of all time, and, and, uh, and, and people were, were flocking to, to Jesus, and so when the disciples show up representing Jesus, they were welcomed. And, and what happened was they didn't need to take anything because God provided for them. In fact, when they came back, they were, they were excited. You know, they, I mean, it was an exciting time to have been away from Jesus because man, it was a blast for them. Uh, they had stories of awesome things happening. They came back, praising, uh, back to Jesus, praising God for what they had done and how he had provided Right? If you think back, we, we studied those stories. And, and, and so they come back and they are, they are charged up, right? I mean, and Jesus goes, hey, you remember that time? Right? And, and as, they, as they remember it, I, I almost hear them as they respond, they say, you know, we, we needed nothing, right? Yeah, right. And so there was a bit of this drawing back of an excitement. And then Jesus goes, but it's not going to be like that this time. Okay, I mean, you hear this, it's almost like this, oh yeah, boom, and the other shoe falls, kind of. And so what we see is, is Jesus really is contrasting that memory or that story with what's going to happen in front of them. So in contrast, Jesus, Jesus warns them this time isn't going to be like that. Now notice what he says, take a purse and a bag. Now these are the very things that Jesus told them not to bring when he sent the 12 out and we sent the 72 out. In fact, both times, sending the 12 out, sending the 72 out, Jesus told them, don't take anything with you. Now, this may seem like an obvious question to you, but, but why do you think they, needed, they, they need to bring their purse and their bag, you know, their wallet, their lunchbox, and their suitcase? Why, why do, I mean, why do you think that is? It's, it's an obvious question, right? But... Because they'll need it? Right, absolutely, right? Because they, they won't be received 
the way they were received before. They are going to have to provide for themselves. They're going to be presenting themselves. They're going to be interacting with the world around them, but relying on what they've brought. Now imagine for a moment. They, they are used to getting special treatment. Think about the arrival into Jerusalem, right? Jesus rides into, into, into town on, on a donkey, and, and people are cheering and, and shouting, and, and they're excited about his arrival. And these disciples, they're, they're hanging out with Jesus. I mean, they were, just by association, well-loved. The, the crowds flocked to him. And for three years, they have been associated with the most popular person in Israel. They've enjoyed the popularity of Jesus, but now, now it, it's going to be so difficult. They need, they, they need to bring everything they're going to need to survive. They're going to need to not only carry money, but food, clothes, and also a sword. Now, I, I held off on the sword because that's the place that is, makes this passage a little bit difficult. See, that's the spot where it almost seems like all the arrows point, right? I mean, I don't know about you. When you were reading it, did, did that part catch you? Because it caught me, all right? The, the sword. So Jesus tells them, buy a sword, right? Trade in your cloak. Go sell the shirt off your back to get a sword. This, I mean, it's kind of an important thing that Jesus is getting at here, right? This is what makes this passage difficult. Jesus has never encouraged violence, and in fact, he instructed his followers to turn the other cheek. And, and quite honestly, this leaves many at a loss with what to do with, the, with this passage. What do we do with this? I mean, there are large portions, I don't know if you know this, maybe not where we live, right? But there are large portions of Christendom that don't believe we should own guns, don't believe we should join the military, don't believe that we should ever really defend ourselves. Pacifists. And some have gone so far as to attempt to say that Jesus didn't actually mean a sword. Well, that's not what he meant, right? I mean, because does, does that really fit with, with the rest of Jesus' story and his person that he's, you know, this... this, this uh, persona that he carried so i thought okay maybe what we'll do is we'll go to the greek right maybe that maybe the word sword here is kind of like you know a little tricky maybe there's a play on words our english doesn't do well so here is the uh the definition for sword from from the greek okay you ready here it is properly a slaughter knife well, that's not giving us any way around it is it right a short sword or dagger mainly used for stabbing an instrument for exacting retribution. And there, there's, I mean, there's no way around this. The word he used here is, it's, it's a difficult one to get to deal with. And there's something in me that is unsure how to reconcile my image of Jesus with this instruction. See, I, I'm not a pacifist. I own guns, and. To be honest with you, I would love to own a sword. But there is something here that catches me a little off guard. Even though I am not, I don't lean that direction, when Jesus says, go buy a sword, I'm like, whoa, that's, what do we do here? And much has been said about these words. Some have tried really hard to explain what Jesus meant here and they've, to, to support their pacifism. And to be honest with you, there are others who have used this passage to support their non-pacifism, okay? In fact, I ran across, as just as I was kind of looking at sermon titles and things like that, um, Jesus supports self-defense is one of the, was one of them. I mean, is this what he's getting at? I, I don't believe that's right. I don't believe either one of these extremes is right. So what do we do with this? Well, first of all, it would seem as though Jesus wants them to have some kind of form of protection. 
a way of defending themselves. I mean, I don't know how we can get around that. There is this element that Jesus is saying here is coming a time when you're going to have to stand your ground. The sword here is not meant to be an offensive weapon, but a defensive tool. Now, we'll, let me circle back around for a moment, all right? Jesus is warning his disciples that things are going to be, uh, aren't going to be the same, that they're going to be tough, right? They're going to, people are going to hate him. Following Jesus isn't going to be easy. People won't be excited to see the disciples. Rather, they're going to hate them. In fact, Jesus said in, in several passages, look at this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, you will be hated by everyone because of me. Do you hear the language? You're going to be hated by everything, everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, when Jesus spoke those words, I wonder if the disciples said, what? You know, we're going to be hated because of you. Everybody loves you. People are flocking to hear you. What, is, what do you mean they're going to hate us because of you? Jesus knew what was coming. John chapter 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. You hear that language? That the world will hate the disciples because of Jesus in them. Because they're associated with Jesus. Because there's something about them that they recognize Jesus in. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 says this, Blessed are those, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's not a way around this. There's this element of being the disciple. That, that there's going to be attack. There's going to be a place where we have to stand firm. So what we need to see as we look at this passage, what we need to see isn't the issue of the sword, right? I mean, let's not, that's not the central point of this passage, to be honest. It's not the sword, but how much different things will be for his disciples, okay? I mean, this is where he's going. Disciples, it's going to be different. This is how different, this is how extremely different it's going to need to, you, things are going to be. You're going to need to have a sword. They are about to come out from under this umbrella that they have been living under, being around Jesus. And when that protection is gone, it's going to be so drastically different than what they have experienced. They step out under the umbrella into a torrential downpour. And it didn't take them long. Think about the story, right? It didn't take them long to run away. Jesus was arrested, boom, they went, Whoa. But Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to be in a place where you can stand firm. I mean, Peter denied knowing him to a slave girl. This is how bad it was under. And they felt it, right? And so even after Jesus' death, they were hiding out. We looked before Pentecost, they were hiding out. This was a strong warning for them. Jesus was warning them. Now, is it a good thing they hid out? I don't know what would have happened had they not hid out. Would the Pharisees and, and the, the chief priests come after the disciples? I don't know. Not real sure, but, but they sure felt like they, the environment changed and they needed to hide out. And so what we see is, see the drastic difference. They went from being connected with the most exciting and popular person in all of Israel to now they felt like, man, they couldn't trust anybody and they had to hide out from everybody. It's a drastic change. Now, Jesus goes on, though, and this is where we begin to see the, the focus needs to be. See, Jesus makes reference to the prophecies concerning him. And he not only makes reference to them, but he says, this is what's happening this is a prophecy being fulfilled. And he refers back to Isaiah. Now, 
Throughout the Old Testament, God had foretold of the Messiah. He, he was telling his people, this is what to expect. This is what's coming. But as a general rule, they kind of picked up only the parts of the prophecies about Jesus um, that mentioned the things they liked. All right? I mean, they noticed the ones about him being a conquering king. That was the Messiah picture that they, they were drawn to. And, and in Jesus' day, they expected a Messiah. They had an image of what he was going to be like. And all of it was positive. It was great. And these are the ones they recognized throughout Scripture. But this is one of those moments where Jesus is revealing something that was told about him that maybe they didn't realize was about him. You know, Jesus did this. Jesus, in fact, when, when, on the road to Emmaus, when he walked with those two disciples, he opened up the scriptures to them. In other words, what he did was is he showed them where the scripture had been pointing to him and how it connected. Imagine if your image of the Messiah was a conquering king in an everlasting kingdom, then the Messiah being numbered as one of the transgressors wouldn't have fit into your picture of the Messiah. The prophecy can be found in Isaiah 53, and, and, and let's just read a portion of it, okay? When Jesus makes this mention, that if he says, this is all coming to fulfillment. It's all coming to a head. Here's what he's referring to. This is what he's saying, and we find in Isaiah 53, starting, we'll start at verse 10, says this, yet it was the Lord's will, okay? And, and he wants them to remember this constantly. This is God's plan. He, he makes reference to it here. He made reference to it before when he talked about who was betraying him, right? Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper on his, in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And he continues on, but I want us to recognize something. This is a, a, a prophetic word about regarding the Messiah. Probably they didn't understand it. Didn't fit the conquering king image and the everlasting kingdom. We continue, therefore I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. Let me back up for a minute. He divides his spoils among the strong. If we go back, Jesus had just told the twelve that he promised them a throne in his kingdom. He divided the spoils among the strong, the ones that are able to stand. He was, this is where it gets interesting, though, right? Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. That's the, that's the passage that Jesus is referring to here. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, so we see what Jesus does, right? He, he, he draws back to this prophecy. And so I want us to, I want us to look at this, this phrase in here that Jesus uses, that he pulls out from that, that prophecy about him. It is numbered with the transgressors. Jesus is numbered with the transgressors. What do you do with that statement? See, because I believe, as I look at this passage, the sword is a distraction because we don't know what to do with it, but the problem is, is if we keep reading, we might miss this statement that Jesus is drawing the attention to. And it's the important part of this, this passage. The sword really isn't the important part of the passage. It's this statement, that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. What does that statement do in you? What, what, so what do you do with it? See, as I read it, as I slow down, that statement stirs something in me. So we know that Jesus goes on to face a death reserved for the most the worst criminals in the, that Romans dealt with. 
This is the, the death that Jesus faces is a death reserved for the worst criminals. Okay, make no mistake about it, Romans were experts in, in making death painful. But this type of death was reserved for their worst. The ones they wanted to make sure they didn't they encouraged everybody else, hey, we don't want to do what they did. So not only does Jesus die for our sins, right? But he dies a death reserved for the worst of the worst. Have you ever thought through this for a moment? It's not that he just, you know, he faced a firing squad where it's over like that. It's not that, that he was euthanized. It's not that, you know, they, they came and, and cut his throat. They didn't get hitting a shot by an arrow. There wasn't anything where it, it happened quickly. This form of death, the way he died, was reserved for the worst. So I, I went back to that word transgressor, okay? I went, I went there because I wanted to know, so am I... It stirs something in me, so, but what is he, what is he saying? And, and I think what happens is this. The word transgressor for me has, has a real, not, not a terrible meaning to it. Okay? In other words, I mean, it's like, oh, you know, transgressions. Oh, you know, when we've hurt somebody. But the word transgressor in the Greek is actually means lawless or wicked. All right? Lawless or wicked. Lawless, without law. Now, for a Jew, to be without law means they, these guys are the, the worst of society. They have no law within themselves. The Jewish people were law, God's law-abiding people. So to be lawless was the worst kind of person. Wicked. I think as we look at it, right, in our world, wicked might be the harder word to deal with. Wicked. Jesus was numbered with the wicked. Jesus was lumped in with that group of people. So who do you think of? I mean, as you think about the wicked, the, the lawless, the transgressors, who, who comes to mind to you? Because if that's, I want us to get the picture of who he was associated with by this type of death. And I have a confession. There, is, there, there are some criminals that, depending on their crime, I feel deserve a horrible death. Now, you may think that's a terrible thought, but there are just some criminals that I think, man, they deserve to die slow and painful because of what they've done to others. I'm sure some might think that sounds cruel. But I'm talking about the worst of the worst. And I won't give you a list of who falls into that category, but we might agree on a few. Now imagine, that's who Jesus gets lumped in with. The worst of the worst. See, in my head, the transgressors, those are those guys that are, you know, oh, that maybe they don't deserve to go to jail. He gets lumped in with that group. You know, he's kind of rebellious. No, no, no. He gets lumped in with the wicked and the lawless. That's how they treated him. He had no sin. He did absolutely no wrong. He is truly the only innocent person who has ever lived. And he dies like the worst of the criminals. What we may not always remember is that according to God, that's what we are like. That is what we deserve. And the only reason he is numbered with the wicked is because he took our place. See, when we soften that word transgressions, we soften our guilt, and we don't recognize just the level that Jesus went to. 
Now, as, we just, as we've kind of finished up this passage, yes, absolutely, there's more things in there. I mean, he says, this is all coming to be completed, right? It's all coming together. We're tying up the loose ends. God has, is bringing these things together, and they're all connecting, is what, what Jesus says. And I think that's a beautiful picture. But then he says, that's enough, right? That's enough. Now, these words have always caused me a, a little bit of pause. Okay, so, so here's what happens, right? Jesus tells him, hey, the, the prophecies are coming to fulfillment in me. And they go, look, we have two swords. I mean, the, the, just for a moment, look at this. Where were they th- thinking? Right? Jesus is talking about a prophecy of, a, of his death. He's being numbered with the transgressors, and they go, hey, we got two swords. What'd they get hung up on? The same thing it's really easy for us to get hung hung up on, the swords. And and as I looked at it, right, I mean, it it always has kind of caused me to pause. Well, we got two swords. Well, there's 12 of them. Well, okay, 11, right? Are two swords really enough? I mean, if it were you, would you want to have to share two swords with 11 other people? When Jesus sent the 12 out, he sent them out two by two. Well, what would you do with the two swords now? If, when he sent the 72 out, he sent them out two by two. Well, two swords definitely wouldn't be enough, right? Who, what four people get the two swords? That's, that would be what, I was, what I'm thinking. Is it enough? Jesus says, that's enough. They, they don't need to all be armed. But Jesus said, if you don't have one, go sell your cloak and get one. Why does he say now that's enough? I know I'd want a sword if everybody else was. If there were two swords floating around in the group, I'd think, man, I'd, I want to be at least having the sword or the guy right behind the guy with the sword. So, so let me give you another option because I think that phrase kind of catches us. Jesus has been warning them about the the coming change. He was just, he's just told them that he's going to be lumped in with the wicked. And they say, look, we've got two swords. It's almost like they weren't really tracking with him. Remember what I said? It's almost like they got hung up on the sword thing. Maybe they're thinking, it's about time we get a sword, right? It's about time we, get, we, we go to arms. And so Jesus says, that's enough. It seems like, maybe, just maybe, all right? Maybe, rather than saying two swords is enough, Jesus is satisfied with the fact that they've been warned. And they'll catch on to it later. We've gone far enough with this conversation. You're not catching on. Let's, that's enough. okay? Because what happens in the next verse is they get up and head to the garden. It's like Jesus goes, end the conversation. Okay, Yeah, you're not tracking. There are times when, have you ever talked to people and you don't feel like they're listening and you go, yeah, forget it, right? I'm not sure Jesus was frustrated, but it seems as though Jesus goes, that's enough of this conversation. It's time to go. See, we see that Jesus leaves the upper room right after it, and so it seems as though Jesus is like, we got to go, right? That's enough. No, two swords isn't what I was talking about. Let's go. It's time to, to leave. And so as we look at this passage, those are the, those are the elements that I just I felt like we, we, we probably just we needed to touch on, and, and there's more in there, uh, right? That, that it's all coming to completion in him is an amazing statement too, um, but but let's shift gears a little bit. Let's move into that. So what do we do with this? I mean, how do we, is there anything we need to apply or that we need to, you know, to say, well, this really works? And, and quite honestly, I mean, I scratched my head a little bit. So I'm like, huh. so what do we do with this, right? So let me ask you, as we look at this passage, what do you hear Jesus saying to you? I mean, that's the real question. Because we've looked at the last two weeks at Jesus warning Peter and now the disciples. We see the warning of sifting. We see Peter's pride issues. And this is the continuation of that warning. 
So we know Jesus' warning of sifting and denial. But then he turns to the disciples and he tells them that the protection or smooth sailing is coming to an end. This is what he's telling them. Hey, it's not going to be like it has been. Everything's going to be different now. And as I process that, as I'm thinking about Christ's formation in us, you know, there's just a couple of things that come to mind. And, and, I, and I don't want to make, this first one, I don't want to make too big. But I also recognize it, that it, it, this passage kind of speaks to it. And this is what I would say. Living in the United States has offered us some advantages. Okay? We have been blessed beyond what we realize. And, and to a degree... Right, A Christian in the, U, in the U.S. is much like the disciples following Jesus in those three years. In those three years of Jesus' life where they, they were kind of under this umbrella as a follower of Jesus. Living in the United States has kind of been a little bit like that. Think about it. Right? We've lived in what has been called a Christian nation. There was a foundation of Christianity and it may not as always, as always showed up in, our, in people's lifestyle, but there has been this sense of moral right and wrong. Jesus was viewed as a good teacher, if nothing else. I mean, you know, even if you didn't want to follow him, uh, there wasn't a lot of negative feeling toward him. That's changing. Make no mistake. We are headed to a day when Jesus' words will become true for us. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Do you hear that? Standing firm is the important piece to it. Being hated by everyone has not been my experience. In my lifetime, I don't feel like I, I, I've tried to be as Christ-like as I can, and, and, I'm, and I'm still growing in that. But in my experience, I haven't really been hated because of being a Christian. And, and I keep thinking, wow, why would people hate me? I mean, what, what about following Jesus is a bad thing? I mean, he calls us, what he calls us to only makes the world around us better. So it's hard for me to grasp that, that people would hate me because of Jesus. But the reason it's hard for me to grasp is because I know him. Because he's in me. Because he's living here. And it's hard for me to believe that, that, it, that anything about being Christ-like is a bad thing. And so we recognize that as long as Christ is being formed in you and in me, it won't make sense why people would hate us but they're going to hate us. I'm not sure what level of rejection you've experienced, but I haven't felt the need for a sword yet. However, I do believe we need to be warned that it isn't always going to be that way. It's there. I mean, I, I, we, I think a lot of us feel that. We're moving that direction. So what do we do with this, right? I mean, as we see the world moving that direction, do we start thinking, well, we need to buy some more guns? We need to stockpile? I mean, is that how we interpret that? We're thinking about Christ's formation in us, right? So somewhere along the way, this, this, we have to bring these two together. Jesus wants his disciples to be strong, okay? Able to defend themselves. But what does that mean for us? And if you're sitting there going, yes, I've got a reason to go buy another gun, then that's, you've missed it. Because, because as he talks about the sword, I, let, me just, let me give you uh, two passages that kind of seem to speak toward this just a little bit. All right, Listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Man, sell what you've got to go ha make sure that you've got a sword. Right, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
we need a sword. We need this sword at work. But we need it in our lives especially as he's being formed in us. So above all else, right? Take what, you, take what you're going to need. Take your cloak, but if you don't have a sword, then sell your cloak and get, take, a, uh, take the sword. But then we know that the sword is also talking about Scripture and God's Word. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. It says this, Finally, be strong. You, you hear the language here? Be strong, be strong, be strong. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So you can take your stand. Jesus is encouraging His disciples, you better be ready to take your stand. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Ah, remember that? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Do you hear it over and over again? Jesus is not encouraging his disciples to run away. He's encouraging them to be ready to stand their ground. Not stand to defend their life, but stand so that they do not walk away from him, that they do not deny him. And then he finishes that passage with this, the sword of the Spirit. So put on the full armor of God, which includes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Are we equipped with his, with his word well enough that when the word, world does turn against us, we can stand? See, that's a formation of Christ in us right there. So that's one of the things I think of when I read this passage. The next thing I think of when we read this passage is, as Christians, we will enjoy times of God's protection spiritually. As Christians, this is what we're going to, we will experience this. And have you experienced it? Have there been these times when, man, it feels like you're just kind of, the temptation isn't real great. You're kind of on this spiritual high, maybe. Things are going well for you. Wouldn't it be great if that all lasted? But then we've also had those experiences, haven't we? Where things aren't easy. That everything's a challenge. And the, the temptation is constantly coming our way. I think about the, the, the disciples, they went out, right? And they, and they did all kinds of amazing things. And they came back and they were excited. They were celebrating. And everything worked perfect. It was almost like they were invincible, right? But everything changed. Jesus was crucified. They hid Jesus was resurrected. He gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the world still was fighting. I really like the times when God is protecting me. And sometimes I wonder why, that, that, why does that have to change? Because those are the times that I feel like I'm growing and my relationship with God is intimate. And then the tough times come. And I'm not loving it. But it's in those times that everything I learned is put to the test. And I can grow, but is it put to the test? It's almost like when a kid is growing and they, and they, and they sprout up, right? But then they're all clumsy. Because somewhere along the way, their body has to learn to manage the, the more that they have. It's required. If we are going to become like Jesus, okay, if we are going to become like Jesus, we're going to have to have every part of our spiritual life tempered, solidified, tested, and made strong. I know we probably use some synonyms in there, but I want you to hear it because I want to to sink in. Every part of our spiritual life needs to be tempered, solidified, tested, made strong. Now the last thing I think of as Christ formed in me as we look at this passage is this. I can't get away from those words. He was numbered 
with the transgressors. And I know I've said this before, but I need to remind, I need the reminder. And maybe you do too. One of the biggest hindrances to Christ being formed in us is the misperception that I'm not as bad as I am. See, we can handle transgressors, but lawless and wicked, see, it's important we understand His love has already taken into account our degree of filth. Right? It, it, we don't need to beat ourselves up. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is if we need to guard against the pride that tells us we're better than we really are. Because when we think we're better than we really are, we begin to think we don't need Him as much. It was our sin It was our condition that took Him to the cross and there isn't anybody who put Jesus through more pain because their their sin was greater. We are all wicked. And He took on the punishment for our wickedness. And and we we don't get to not be in that category. It reminds me when I, when I come back to that point, it's not so I can be beat up about how wicked I am. What it reminds me of and what it tells me is that, that I am desperate. I'm desperate for His transformation. See, I offer filthy rags. My, even... even My best efforts today, even, they don't even compare to what I need. And He wants to change me from the the mess that I am. I'm still a mess in comparison to who He is. I'm in desperate need of His transformation. So as we look at this passage, those are the three things that I pull out as we look about look at what, what can we take in his formation in, in us. Would you acknowledge today where he's spoken in, this word, in his word? Would you, would you acknowledge where you heard him as we, as we close in prayer today? Lord Jesus, as, as I look through that, I acknowledge to you that there are times I get in this mode where, where I start to think, back then I needed your sacrifice. But today, you know, I've, I've grown and I've, I've gotten so much farther along in this journey that, that now I'm kind of standing on my, on my own. And, and the truth is, is, I need you just as much today as I did in the worst parts of my life. I'm so grateful that you still love me, that you still take in all of that into account. You were numbered with the transgressors. I recognize where our our, our, our Society's going, and I recognize that we need to learn to stand firm. Would you teach us how to do that? May we stand firm to the end. Thank you for your word, and I thank you for speaking to my heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for tuning in, and... uh, once again, keep, in, you know, keep me in the loop, would you please? Let me know you're still out there. and uh, um, It doesn't have to be on the video. It, uh, it, it just email me even, all right? Let us know. You can call the church, even if you left a message with the secretary, just, to know that, just so that I know you're still out there and you're doing well, okay? Thanks again.